welcome to Piano Class with Teacher Jeff. In this series, we'll be talking about common topics that come about when learning piano. Uh, this is episode one, and today we'll be talking about scales. Before we start playing, we are going to talk about why learn scales in the first place. Um, you know, if you're thinking to yourself, well, my teacher told me to, that's a okay answer I guess I'm glad you're learning it but um, I wrote down a list of reasons why people play scales they develop your awareness of tonality and you know knowledge of different keys um, they help you develop fast fingers um, honestly when you start learning piano and you watch somebody play you think to yourself wow that person's amazing Chances are they're probably only just playing a scale or an arpeggio. Um, if you want to improvise, my knowledge of scales is very, very helpful. Um, they, honestly, they help help you cross your thumb on practicing. That is um, important. Uh, help develop coordination. Um, help you like learn the geography of the keyboard. Um, it can help you uh, learn our different rhythms, articulation, which we'll talk about at the end of the show. So when we learn scales, there are three things that we need to keep in mind. One, you must always play forte. Two, you must always use the right fingering. And three, you must play legato. That might change later on, but as when you first learn it, it's more important to play legato than anything else. Okay, so now we are going to play through some of these. Now, before we talked about a couple of things we need to keep in mind, um, one of them is fingering. So, when you look at all the scales, there are 24 of them, there's 12 keys, and there's a major and minor for each one. Um, when I was learning them, I, I, I thought, wow, man, this is memorizing all these fingerings, it's such a nightmare. Um, when I you know, grew up, I realized that there are really only three different types of fingering. Um, there's the regular fingering, which is C, D, E, G, and A, major and minor. So that's one, two, three, one, two, three, four. And the left hand's the same thing, just backwards. One, two, three, one, two, three, four. And then when you end, go to the extremes, you end on uh, five, so we don't have to cross over again. And, I want to do this as little as possible, um, in general. Okay, so there's that's the regular fingering. Then there's the thumbs on F and thumbs on C. That would be F major and minor, B major and minor, G flat major, D flat major, um, things like that. Okay, when your thumbs play together, I don't know what you're probably thinking. B, B major, your thumbs go on E and B. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, you think about it like, like if it's C-flat, then mainly the concept is, you know, your, your thumbs go in between the groups of black notes, like that. Okay? And then there's a one that's usually reserved for flat, that's 3, 2, 1, 4. B-flat, 3, 2, 1, 4. And then again, 3, 2, 1, 4. All right? E flat's one of these, and then A flat, major and minor for that one. Okay, and there's really one exception, and that's F sharp minor, which I teach last. Because by the time they get there, they'll figure it out. <laughs> so, what I usually do is I start off playing two octaves, um, just up and down, nothing extreme. I rarely teach one octave scales to to people uh, because they're usually smart enough to figure it out. I, you know, uh, probably about a, three weeks ago, I taught a five-year-old how to play two octave scales, and she learned it in a week. It's pretty amazing, huh? Um, I was I was impressed anyway. <laughs> so I started off with two octaves, just up and down. Now. Um, <coughs> And then once they filter through that, 
we usually go to four octaves up and down, usually by the time they reach A flat. Um, although I don't really have a precise timeline. And then once we shuffle through all the scales, uh, we do what my teacher taught me. Um, I think she learned it in Russia or something like that. So it's four octaves up, it's four octaves down, two octaves up, contrary motion, and then back down. So... <laughs> about is you have to play forte. I have quite a lot of students who play their scales quite uh, like this. And no, I did not edit the sound down. <laughs> uh, they play really that delicately. Um, it's not a good way to, but it doesn't make a pleasant sound to listen to. So why practice using that sound? Also, it doesn't really build any kind of finger strength. So we need to just, like on my pre previous example, we need to go through with forte. And not like this. And the last thing we talked about is legato. For those who don't know, legato basically means that the notes are connected together. And there's no big gap between them but they're not really on top of each other either. Kind of right next to each other in a smooth sort of fashion, you know? Something like that. So now we're gonna talk about tips to help you learn this more efficiently. I suggest using a metronome. This is mine. Um, this, uh, I don't know if I can say the brand name, but let's just say it went to medical school. They also have me um, metronomes for your phone for free, actually. Um, how convenient. Um, but we're just going to use this one for now. Uh, the reason you use a metronome is because your perception of speed is subjective. And what do I mean by that? It means you think you're playing slow, but chances are you're probably not. Or vice versa, that happens sometimes. Uh, especially with uh, kids who are young and shy. <laughs> they think they're playing fast, but they're going... So it's nice to find a, a comfortable speed that we can play this at. When you first learn it, I don't usually start off people with a metronome. However, as you get into it for a month or two or three, um, let me talk about it. It's not a good idea to do this. Where we have one note per click. You probably want to do two and certainly um, later on four notes per click. And the reason is, is because if every note is a beat, it just sounds forced and kind of clumpy. It also prevents you from playing faster. Um, now when you play, let's just say we're doing four octaves, when you play it and you, and one click is four notes. You notice that the click, there is one click on each note. There is a click on C, a click on D, a click on E, a click on F, etc., etc. I mean, it's really common to, when you cross your thumb under to, for it to go clonk, and playing it in that, in that, in that metronome setting helps you kind of avoid that. So now we're going to talk about a couple of other pitfalls that I see a lot of my students fall into. Um, so one of them is playing like this. Okay, we need to sit up straight. All right. um, when I practice my scales, the really the only reason I do it is because. I don't have enough coffee, and I just got out of bed, and I'm tired and grumpy, and so my posture isn't quite right. And so 
playing the scales and I play a few exercises too. And it really helps me find my posture so I can play more comfortably and for longer. I could um, also make a better tone. You don't really, this is not really, I know we all see people on Instagram play like that, but that's not really a, a healthy option. Okay. The other th common problem I see my students do is this. Yeah, it, it, sometimes it's that bad. It, you know, maybe it looks worse because I'm over six feet tall and they're like this, you know, that tall. Um, <coughs> but it's, it's, so what we want to do, we generally want to keep our, our elbow somewhat still. I mean, basically, we, our arm is going to be, our wrist rather, is going to be going sideways and not up and down like that. Maybe this will give you a better angle at it. So this needs to go sideways like this. And instead of getting your thumb out by moving your elbow out, we kind of gently move our thumb in and then the rest of it will be taken care of by the whole wrist going that way. Okay, so I get it. These things aren't exactly the most exciting things to listen to. It's not a Beethoven sonata or anything like that. Instead of just playing it, we could break it up into different rhythms. And then, those are just the two known varieties. Long, short, long, short, or short, long, short, long. We can do. different ways to, to do that. Okay, the other thing is, is if you're spending hours and hours and hours practicing your scales, you probably need to take a break. I really don't recommend practicing over 15 or 20 minutes tops, and that's it, like on a bad day. Okay, so that basically sums everything up. Just to review, scales are good for your technique, and if you're into improvising, it might make you a better improviser if you know all of them. So when we play scales, we need to keep in mind three things. It needs to be forte, it needs to be legato, and we need to use right fingering. Uh, there's also a different variety of ways to spice things up. Try it with different articulation. Try it with different rhythms. Also, make sure we're sitting up straight, have a good posture, shoulders back, nice and tall and also we don't cross our thumb under our third or fourth finger by doing the chicken dance and flying our elbows up like this fly 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 okay um if you have any comments i think you can comment down there if you want to see more stay tuned we have an episode plan of more advanced scales. We got an episode coming up about two note slurs. We're going to learn a whole piece together a prelude and a fugue. Ooh, how to interpret that? What's good and what's bad? What you need to get started? I hope you enjoyed the video.